Welcome back to the Fearless Training Raw Knowledge Podcast with your host, myself, Alex Connor, where we talk everything training, nutrition, and lifestyle, respectively. First things first, FTU, the Fearless Training United Academy, is now exclusively live. Guys, what is it? It is the Netflix of fitness. If you want more information, click the links below. You can have myself and some of the best practitioners leading the industry in your pocket 24-7, teaching you everything you need to know so you can stop wasting your time, money, and resources and actually get real tangible results and education. And if you're not following me on any of my or all of my social media handles and you like my information, you want to learn more about what I do, you want more information about quality Um, resources, quality information about anything training, nutrition, and lifestyle related with a bit of entertainment sprinkled in, then make sure you head over to my YouTube channel, my Instagram, and all my links are in the show notes below. Now, my guest this week is Cliff Harvey. Again, a brief brief synopsis because I'm going to let him do the intros as now I'm doing with all my guests. He is an author, a clinician, researcher, and speaker. He is a leader in the field of carb-appropriate nutrition, mind-body healthcare, and the achievement of success in health and performance. And we have a very, very interesting and thought-provoking conversation. I thoroughly enjoyed the chat. Cliff is a top bloke. We got on well and we covered a lot of key topics. There's a lot of value, as always, in this for you guys. Nice, natural flow to the conversation. Uh, We talked about his work with some of New Zealand's top athletes and also with athletes and other clientele uh, that are, you know, morbidly obese or struggle with adherence and how to actually move the needle in the right direction amongst other things nutrition related. And without further ado, enjoy this week's conversation between myself and Cliff Harvey. Cliff, welcome to the Fearless Training Raw Knowledge Podcast, my friend. Thank you for joining me this morning uh, just across the pond in New Zealand. How are we? I'm good. Thanks for having me on, mate. Absolutely. My pleasure. My pleasure indeed. So let's start off, as we always do, at the beginning. And uh, for people who may not be aware, (laughs) give us a bit of a synopsis about yourself, what you do, who you are, more importantly, why you do everything that you uh, are currently working on and have worked on? That's, that's a broad question. Basically, um, in a nutshell, I'm a clinical nutritionist. You know, I don't like to really overstate what it is that I do. I, I work mainly in nutrition. I started working in nutrition about 23 years ago, I think now, um, as a nutrition coach, as sort of an adjunct to my personal tra- uh, training practice. Started as a student practitioner and realized pretty early on that a lot of what we were doing and a lot of what we were being taught at the time just wasn't comprehensive enough, uh, particularly with respect to the macro prescriptions. And so I started looking into keto and and low carb and what I now call that carb appropriate spectrum, which sort of encompasses from keto through to low carb through to moderate or higher carb diets and started really trying to fine tune what would work best for the individual rather than just having this arbitrary prescription. And so I became more and more fascinated with nutrition rather than just training. Uh, went on to study naturopathy actually as my undergrad because at the time you could really focus on nutrition within naturopathy, but it was a little bit freer in terms of what could be prescribed. Um, I also like the idea of holism in its true sense, although I understand that there is, you know, also a lot of wacky woo stuff in the natu- naturopathic fields. Um, but I was approached that very much as a scientific naturopath who was applying evidence-based interventions, whether that be nutrition or some limited herbal medicine, and obviously supplementation, along with lifestyle things. Um, so I worked in practice for a long time as a clinical nutritionist naturopath, uh, studied various other things, you know, modalities that included mind body Uh, interventions to really try and increase the coaching and lifestyle um, benefits that I could provide to my clients and actually started my postgrad journey in mind body as well uh, in the mind body track at AUT University Um, so I did my postgrad cert and postgrad dip actually in mind body medicine moved uh, from there back back into nutrition and did my master's uh, master's and doctorate in nutrition focused really on ketogenesis keto flu and 
then moving back into that idea of trying to determine what diet was best for an individual. Um, so that sort of takes us through from the late 90s when um, Michael Jordan re- ruled the courts and Celine Dion ruled the airwaves through to now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it sounds like it's been quite the experience and, and quite a few things that I'd like to unpack there as well, Cliff, because it's, um, yeah, there's a few interesting key topics and I think we could probably shed a light on a lot of the misconceptions and maybe some of the most common mistakes people maybe perhaps think or get caught up in within those realms of nutrition, etc. The first point I want to touch on, because it's quite funny, and um, he said that you, know, you mentioned the, the sort of the low-fat, high-carb approach and the dogma at the time, and you got you kicked out of class apparently for, for challenging this. This is, this is uh, back when you were studying. Can we like touch base on why that was? And I, obviously, a curious soul and like how that sort of came about. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, in retrospect, I think a lot of people can look at that as as me wanting to be contrary, um, particularly with my history. You know, I'd been kicked out of high school as well, so this was not a good precedent. Uh, I was kicked out of high school for a, a, quite a different reason altogether, but it was still about sort of questioning the the, the dogma as it was. When I went to uh, university at AUT first time around, um, we were very much taught that there needed to be this minimum level of carbohydrate. And at the time, a lot of the guidelines and a lot of our lecturers were suggesting that should be about 65% of calories. The problem was that when I went to our physiology classes, you know, the physiology of nutrition, and we would learn about the roles of the macronutrients, it didn't really make sense. And when I was starting to look into the research, and there was beginning to be this particularly emergent research on the the importance of protein and how that had probably been under-recognized previously, there was this weird thing where if I was giving someone the, the optimum amount of protein for their goal and then maybe the minimum amount of protein that was being suggested for the uh, mitigation of overtraining syndrome and uh, mitigation of effects on hormonal balance and things like that, often there simply wasn't enough left to provide for this big carbohydrate allotment. And so that really got me thinking about, well, what do we actually want to prioritize here? Is it protein and the minimum amount of fat, or is it carbohydrate at the expense of those things? Now, given that carbohydrate is technically non-essential, and we can obviously talk about that because that's misconstrued as well, but because carbohydrate is technically non-essential in the diet, it made sense to me to really make sure that people were getting enough protein and a minimum amount of fat, particularly those essential fats. And so uh, consequently, I started asking a, a lot of inconvenient questions in those nutrition lectures. And um, by that stage, I'd done enough to pass the course and the, the lecturers were getting quite um, frustrated with the questions. And so they sent me to the dean and he said, look, dude, you've done enough to pass. So we're going to give you a pass. Just don't go to lectures for the rest of the year. And so I spent the rest of the year reading up on protein and um, lifting weights and surfing. And it was great. There you go. There you go. It's good. And uh, look, I think it's great. You know, I love a man who challenges a status quo. Um, and you've got to be curious. And I think that comes from um, that, that's something that's lacking a lot these days. You know, people want everything now and they just want this one answer. And people are lacking this ability to think critically um, and, you know, look at things three dimensionally rather than just going, oh, it, it's just this thing and, and that's it. It's like, well, even if we do have literature on it and even if we do have experience, it's still good to question things and that's how we learn. So I think that is a good sign of someone who, like you said, is perhaps a little bit contrary or, or someone who, who looks at things a little bit deeper. And we need people like that to deconstruct it and then find better ways going forward. So perhaps based on what you said there, Cliff, to kind of set the scene going forward to give the listeners some more context, can you perhaps go in and define um, some of the biggest misconceptions within this space uh, around that? And perhaps just um, give a little bit of clarity around, you know, some low carb versus high carb approaches, what you found, what the literature says versus your experience. And then perhaps we can look at that with your work with some, you know, obviously top athletes and even just the clients that you've worked with to help them, you know, achieve better performance and, and better body compositions. Yeah, sure. So I think one of the key things is to, to recognize that we can be contrarian. Uh, sort of as a standpoint, as almost our ethos. And that's not always beneficial either, because if we're purely contrarian, as a lot of people in the alternative health field are, then they become very conspiratorial and they're sort of pushing back against evidence to some degree. 
uh, where I saw the difference, especially as I started out, was it appeared to me that we had a lot of things that were legacy uh, position statements that were not always based on the evidence. So I think one of the things I was able to do, and not perfectly back at that stage, you know, I look back at what I was doing then, it was very naive in many respects because I was a new practitioner. Um, but one thing that I'm, I'm thankful for having done was to really look at things with, with fresh eyes and evaluate what we were being told based on the evidence. So this wasn't a, a position that was in contrast to the evidence. And I think that speaks to one of the big problems we have nowadays is that a, a lot of people are construing science as being, well, what do I see in a position statement? What do I see in a review, perhaps, although they are the highest in the hierarchy of the evidence, but what do I see in a position statement? What do I see in a review? What do I hear from people that I assume to be really credible? And that science and anything that appears to be in contrast to that is anti-scientific. We've kind of missed the step where we're actually looking at the evidence and we're looking at it through the lens of number one, plausibility. Is it plausible? And that's where that research process really starts into demonstrability. What are we actually seeing in the evidence in terms of functional outcomes? And then creating our positions or our uh, treatments, our prescriptions based upon that. You know, we're sort of getting this proxy third party stuff going on. So I think that's one of the key things is that we need to recognize that it's, it's like exactly what you said. We need to be open to the possibilities. You know, I'll put that in perspective. I had a, um, another practitioner to say to me, well, herbal medicine simply doesn't work. There's no evidence for it. And a statement like that to me, and this is a very scientific guy, uh -huh. but the, that sort of statement to me makes no sense whatsoever because number one there is evidence that a lot of herbal um, medicines work extremely effectively the reality is that that particular practitioner because of their scope of practice simply hasn't looked at the evidence um, and that also because something is seen as being maybe strange or peculiar or outside of your particular scope of expertise doesn't mean that it shouldn't be studied we're putting the car before the horse if we say, well, oh, that seems weird, I'm not going to study it. We have to study it in order to see whether it in fact does work and whether there is a potential for that to lead to further research and then we can really grow and evolve. So that's why I sort of say that, um, you know, I'm a very holistic practitioner and researcher, but people misconstrue that. That to mean I walk around in a caftan and have scented candles on and stuff. Now, I might do that, but that's not the point. The, the point is we're looking at yeah. holism as being all of the things that affect the human organism and all of the things that can help to improve that, the human potential of that organism. And we need to evaluate all those things. Now, I've been very um, vilified down here in the naturopathic community for coming out against certain things. You know, I've published research reviews on hair mineral testing, for example. I just don't think it's a valid test. And so, of course, I get emails from people saying, how dare you take away one of these tests? And I say to them, well, I'm not taking anything away from you. I'm just saying that if, if, a, if you've got a shitty test, then don't use it. There's so many other things you can use. That doesn't preclude holism. I think that actually is holism because science and evidence supports pragmatic evidence-based holism that gets the best results. I know I went tangential there and I probably answered your question by proxy, but <laughs> it's the, the way it works. No, it is. No, I love it. And, and you know, that's what, that's what we're about. You know, it's, it's raw knowledge. We've got to let it flow and wherever it goes, like we'll follow the line of inquiry. Um, but you made some great points there <laughs> as well. And I, I think, you know, kind of to reiterate or maybe underline and underscore those a little bit, it is, I think there's these sort of like buzzwords and they're stereotyped. You know, I was having a conversation with uh, a couple of clients the other day, and I said, if you think bodybuilder, I said, tell me what you think of. And they sort of stood there and I said, look, um, tell me if this is accurate. I'm like, big guy, probably very large, someone who takes performance enhancing drugs, bit ego. And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, all right. I said, but do you see all the other guys who perhaps are, and there's not just two types as many, I said, who are doing it differently, who are quite humble. You know, they may not look completely huge until they take their shit, all these things. And they sort of looked at it and I said, look, this is what I mean about 
you know, weight training because they were sort of like, I can't train weights. Like I'm going to hurt myself. I've got injuries. And I said, well, I said, the mm. devil's kind of in the details there. So I think going back to what you were saying, again, it's not having, not being tunnel visioned. And the irony is that, as you said, you've got to study something to be able to make those statements. You can't just be very, very evidence-based or over on the right side and go, well, no, like I'm, I'm closed off to that. Well, it's like, well, the very definition of being a true practitioner and being kind of scientific is that, and I got this drummed into me by a gentleman in New Zealand on my, um, my anatomy and physiology because I stood up and basically had a bias towards creatine and I got ripped apart, but that was a good learning curve. And he goes, you've got to be, you know, when you, pre- <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you've got to present evidence. Like you, you can't be for or against, you have to present what is and take the emotion out of it. And that is hard sometimes. And I think people and practitioners, they get so, you know, glued to, to whatever they do, they become too much almost specialist these days. And like you said, they forget this holistic approach. Yeah. And then you mentioned holistic to people. And then they think, like you said, you're walking around in candles in the seventies or whatever it might be, um, which is completely <laughs> different. Um, so perhaps now with that, let's transition with that in mind to you've worked with a lot of uh, high level athletes over the years. I know you've had a background in rugby, uh, sports specific um, athletes, etc. Um, could you talk about some of the, the work you've done with them, like your approaches within the realms of nutrition and even, you know, other people that you've worked with perhaps more, I don't like to use the word general population, but people who are perhaps not on the yeah. front line and how you've actually used real takeaway applications to, to help them achieve better body compositions in a, in a sustainable way. Yeah. Um, I did a lot of work in the early days with athletes. In fact, that, that were my biggest clientele in the early days, along with people with quite severe metabolic disorder. Now, at the time, I'll be straight up, I was probably slightly outside of scope of practice working with some of those metabolically disordered patients. But, um, you know, I was a student practitioner and I was sort of under the care of mentors and whatnot. Uh, the reason I was working with them, of course, is because they simply had not got results through orthodox means so they needed something a little bit different but yeah I, I worked a lot with athletes in the early days starting with um my first high performance athletes were members of the new zealand rugby league team uh work with you know various professional rugby players uh world champion boxers like joe parker uh world champion martial artists like orlando sanchez and others uh really a huge range you know doug viney brad riddell who's a ufc fighter um, shane young did some work with him before his entry to the UFC, all sorts. So through the years, I've worked a lot. Team New Zealand, America's Cup, yachting, uh, all sorts. But really the, the key from my point of view was really number one to, to have the recognition that the foundation of performance is health. And the, the reason that comes to mind first is I'm actually speaking at a conference in a couple of weeks for the Australasian College of Nutritional and Environmental Medicine. And this is a real key aspect of that talk is that athletes actually know quite a lot about nutrition. And a lot of them know a lot, particularly about the pointy end of nutrition, where they might read about, you know, specific supplements or little fine tuning things they might do to, to really try and get that extra, you know, nth degree of benefit. But there are fundamental lacks within what they were, what they're doing on the foundations. So you know, it's really about the keys. Number one being quality. Now, when I say that, people think I suffer from the naturalistic fallacy, which is that you know natural is better than synthetic. I don't. The the rationale there is that the quality of nutrition I look at as being a compendium of food based on natural, unrefined foods. Again, it's not naturalistic fallacy because time and time again, the evidence shows us that when we base our diet on a compendium of unrefined foods, we get better outcomes. And that's becoming clearer and clearer by the day. It also means that typically people can auto-regulate energy more effectively. So they tend to eat an appropriate amount, which is obviously key for an athlete. And they tend to have better resiliency in terms of taking in uh, the essential omega-3 fats and vitamins and minerals and secondary nutrients that help support health and help support um, resistance to break down over time. So really that, that quality aspect comes first and that's really that fundamental of health being the foundation of performance. Then obviously we get into the fine tuning where we're looking at macro content, um, perhaps supplements that can support food. So there I sort of talk about food-like supplements and then the, the, the final stage is to look at supplementation that 
provides actual ergogenic or performance uh, enhancing benefits. And so really it's just about taking a step-by-step -step process to make sure they're covered in the foundations first to get the biggest bang for buck, then fine tuning according to the individual. And that's where a lot of the, the work that I've done in practice and the research that we've done comes into play because then it comes down to looking at, well, what's, what strategy is gonna work best for the individual? It's not like I would put everyone on keto, that would be crazy. But it's similarly, it's not like I would put everyone on you know, 80, 10, 10, because that would be equally crazy. Um, so it's about the individualizing for the, um, for the athlete. Mm -hmm. No, great stuff. And, and I want to sort of delve into that now, because I think this is a gray area and something that I speak of very similarly as well, when I'm trying to explain this to clients and talking about specificity and individuality and kind of contexting that and giving it a frame. And as you rightly said, uh, even, even um, like you said, not just athletes. It's funny, actually. It's a bit of a juxtaposition, right? The athletes uh, know a lot about the base nutrition and they neglect it and they're at the fine end of the pencil. And then we have, I guess, the people who are generally more, you know, general population or whatever you may call them, people who don't want to be top athletes. And they are sort of, yeah, they're, they're looking at these supplements and whatnot as well, but they don't really have that context and structure and they don't understand where that individuality comes in and they're trying to, again, kind of put the cart before the horse. Could you give us some yeah. real life examples of um, perhaps maybe first like athletes that you've worked with and like the biggest challenges you face with them? And you might even, because I, I know it's a case by case basis, but you might take a couple or a handful that sort of stand out in your mind, some of the biggest challenges you've, you've faced with them and some of the actual strategies, um, systems and processes or whatever you want to refer to them as that you've helped them to achieve a higher performance. And then perhaps we can contrast that with someone who is just trying to perhaps effectively lose weight and they've not been able to do it. And I might even throw some examples at you that I've faced that I find challenging just so the people listening can kind of go, cool, yeah, that's, that's real. Yeah. Yeah, well, the, interestingly, uh, my, my athletes haven't really had significant challenges in terms of following the nutrition plans I put together and getting great results. I guess the, um, the, the one challenge that I've seen, and this is particularly so with athletes who have very uh, sporadic competition schedules, so really here we're talking about fighters, you know. Mm -hmm. We might be fighting a couple of times a year, um, especially when they're at that top top level, there can be that tendency to just go AWOL and you don't even hear from them for six months or a year until they've got a fight coming up and like, dude, I'm 20 kilos overweight. Can you cut me for this fight? It's like, sure. Um, so really one of the key challenges within that is uh, I talk about it in, in terms of a lot of athletes think about how can I be be a better yachtsman if they're one of you know the, the yachties I've worked with or how can I be a better fighter how can I be a better this we do a bit of an exercise where we get them to step back from that and say well that's great that's really important for you to do and obviously your training is going to be specific to that and some of your nutrition is going to be really specific to that but let's first and foremost look at how do you be a better athlete in general how do you be a better human and achieve your the human potential because that, that again is looking at foundations and I use a really good example I obviously didn't work with him um, actually a, a, a guy I know uh, John Barati I think did a lot of work with him you know obviously GSP um, he I, I've heard some things from him and this might be apocryphal but I heard some things from around the time when he lost his title to Matt Serra and he recognized that although at the time he was considered one of the best martial artists in the world, and he went on to obviously be arguably one of, if not the greatest, he recognized that there were various parts that weren't quite optimized. And that wasn't about being the best martial artist. It was about being the best athlete. So it's well known that he has fantastic nutrition advice and he has fantastic strength and conditioning. And he does a lot of recovery work and all these various things that then fit in together. So he's a great example for, for my athletes and there are other examples out there of people who have really decided to optimize their human potential and then that allows them to fine tune their specific skills for their sport. So that, that's probably been one of the challenges, but it's a challenge that once people have that breakthrough moment, they kind of get it and it's quite easy then to get the buy-in. Um, in terms of some of that 
individuality. A, a really good example is, and I presented this at some medical conferences, I, I had two, two clients, and I won't mention who they are because they have um, fights coming up and I, I don't think it's appropriate right now, but I had a couple of clients who were both at the very top of the fight game, both at the time Muay Thai fighters, um, now obviously competing in mixed martial arts, and similar weight class at the same level, basically world championship level. One of those athletes simply cannot get lean unless he's on low carb. Now, whether that's an adherence thing or whether it's just that it fits physiologically for him, I think it's a bit of both. Uh, he, he really can't get lean without following a low carb diet. And so for a number of his fights, he would be very low carb, basically ketogenic leading up to the fight and then we'd replenish or replete some of that carbohydrate for the fight. So interesting thing happened. For one of his fights, he, he looked really great, looked super impressive, demoed the dude he was fighting. And I got in contact with him straight afterwards and said, oh, that, looked, that looked great. You know, obviously everything went really well. And he said, oh, you know what? I forgot to carb up. <laughs> so he forgot to carb up before the fight and he'd been following a low carb diet and yet he looked phenomenal. From there on, he didn't really worry too much about a carb up because he obviously didn't need it. Now, that flies in the face of what most people would say, but let's face it, when you're fighting, let's say, an MMA fight of three five-minute rounds, or you're fighting a uh, you know, professional Muay Thai fight where it might even be a shorter time frame than that, mm -hmm. it's not a lot of time. It's, uh, it's almost impossible that you would deplete glycogen sufficiently within that time, no matter what you're doing, right? 15 minutes of activity. You're not going to deplete your, your glycogen levels. So it really comes down to, in that case, the, the individual and their preference and then how they've adapted. In contrast, um, the other athlete who's in a very similar weight class at the very top of the sport, basically it's truckloads of carbs. It's a very, what I would say, sort of clean, natural, unrefined diet, but it's a truckload of carbs ripped to shreds. Bloods look fantastic. There is no way that I would put him on a low-carb diet because why? You know, the, the dude is at the very top of the game and he's killing it. And he's basically following a, a diet that is really at odds with the other one. So that's a great example of the, the individuality that can occur uh, within one sport, within seemingly quite similar people, although I think they have quite different physiologies to some degree. Um, I'll, I'll finish off with one other example because this is more from the pathology side. I mentioned earlier on that a lot of my early clients were people with severe metabolic disorder. Now, these were people with severe metabolic disorder or diabetes who had been bounced around within the sort of hospital dietetic system and uh, were massively obese, like morbidly obese, 200 kilos plus. So, you know, for those other listeners out there, 440 pounds plus, and um, had really struggled to lose weight. Now, they can lose weight for a time, but the intervention back then was pretty much that you need to be very high carb, extremely low fat, and just calorie restricting. So continued calorie restriction to a point where, you know, we're getting down to six, 800 calories a day for pretty large males. And that's just simply not sustainable. No. So for them, a, a low carb or keto approach in which they could eat far more ad libitum worked incredibly well. And for a lot of them, the vast majority in fact that weight loss was sustainable and it was sustained over many years so that was really a wake-up call for me because I, I i i thought that it would work when it actually did and we had long-term and sustained results that showed that irrespective of any pushback you can't deny the end of one result where that person has basically gone from a very dangerous health situation to being back to somewhat within normal ranges. You know, when you see corrections in blood lipids and HbA1c and, you know, body weights, body weight losses of 50 or 100 kilos, uh, these are pretty profound results. And so it, it really speaks to the, the need to apply a nutrition plan that actually works for the person. And like I said, it's not, a, it's not just about the physiology. It's about the psychology and the, the, the psychosocial uh, environment that, that person's in as well. Yeah. No, those are great examples, and thank you for sharing those, Cliff, as well. And I think that really demonstrates, as you said, where and how things can change so drastically 
and rightly so if something's working even if it goes against the literature quote unquote it, it works right um and that's where i think that anecdotal comes in or that experience and goes well hey look maybe we can explain it maybe we can't explain it but if it works it works it works for this person but it doesn't work for this person so to kind of ask i think more of an obvious question that stems from that before we move on is is there any markers any markers any tells any specific um behaviors that you look for within clients or athletes that you work with that uh, uh, tells if you like whether that is from you know a more pathological sense whether it's more behavior sense um whether it's an emotional sense where you go okay this is not working i'm going to try perhaps a more ketogenic approach or i'm going to try a more high carb approach is there any specific things that you look for and perhaps is there um do you use a process do you have a check-in system with the athlete if you ask them certain questions you collect certain amounts of data where you can go cool based on this this and this from my experience this is now where we're going to lead into something a or b um does that make sense absolutely um so i think at the broadest level the the outcome or the desired outcome to some degree will influence what type of diet someone's on and, and then we sort of fine tune based on the, the individual the reason i want to bring that up is I, I think it's important because one thing that often happens is if we compare for example low carb to high carb diet so low carb higher fat or low carb higher protein versus uh, high carb lower fat it's true that over time Okay, so initially, I, I think most people would agree that people lose more weight and lose more body fat on a low-carb nutrition plan. We're just talking about on average here, across all, all populations. But I think we would all agree, based on the evidence as well, that those effect sizes narrow over time, and there may not be a, a large difference post sort of 12, 18 months. The challenge within that is that is often, I, I see, used as almost an excuse to discredit the low-carb or, or keto intervention because people will say, well, over time, there's actually not much difference. So why would you, why would you do that? You know? And then the next sort of position that people take is, well, low-carb's stupid. It doesn't have any advantage over high-carb. Right. So we need to sort of unpick that a little bit. If we can agree that low-carb and keto diets, typically, based on the evidence, have better results in the short term, we have to look at what happens at sort of 12, 18 months. What we see is that there probably still is some uh, superiority of low carb or keto for longer term fat loss as well. And that's particularly so when we do, when we look at systematic reviews and meta analyses that subgroup down into very low carb. However, the effect size between them is very small. That's true as well. So there probably isn't any meaningful difference. But that's no reason to discredit the keto or low-carb approach because it's as good, if not maybe marginally better, but maybe not meaningfully better. So mm -hmm. where does that leave us? We then need to basically look at, well, what's going to work best for the individual? And so this is when I think we start to fine-tune a little bit more and where, where someone has a greater tendency towards metabolic syndrome, uh, insulin resistance, it's likely that they will benefit more from a low carb approach. Now that's for several reasons. They, they probably benefit more physiologically anyway, and they also are likely to adhere to that approach better. Whereas if someone is more, I guess, insulin sensitive, more metabolically well-ordered, if we want to say that, they, they might actually benefit more from a higher carb approach. So we, we really need to start differentiate, dif differentiating out the, the individuals. And that might also have something to do with adherence factors. So we can start by looking at the physiology in terms of the bottom up approach. Okay, how, how well is this person in terms of their metabolic functioning? And we can start to get an idea about where they should be in terms of macro splits. But then, as we know, because the effect size between these different diets can be pretty damn small over time, we need to look at what the person's going to be able to adhere to. And we get indications of that from the physiology, like I mentioned before. More insulin resistant, probably likely to adhere to low carb better. More insulin sensitive, you know, it's probably not so much of an issue. So they may be better off on a higher carb diet. 
But on an individual level, there are going to be differences in behaviors um, in the psycho-emotional and psycho state, uh, psychosocial state of that person. And they're going to just gravitate to certain things better. So, for example, in, in terms of auto-regulating how much energy someone puts in, in other words, not overeating, keto or low-carb might really help someone because it's very satiating. On the other hand, someone might hate that type of diet and they really want to be on a higher-carb vegan diet. And if they can stick to that, and it's, again, helping them to auto-regulate calories, that's going to be better. Uh, I think that's also why fasting can be such a beneficial intervention because, hey, if nothing else, if we sort of step back from all the, the big claims about fasting, some of which might be spurious, it's still been proven to have benefit. And a lot of that benefit is simply likely to be it helps people to auto-regulate how much energy they're putting in. So we're really running the gamut here from physiology, and there are some factors that we would look at there through to psychology and, and behaviors of eating. Uh, we think, but we weren't able to... It sounds like real confirmation bias. I'm going to rephrase that. <laughs> we think, and we ran some, uh, a study looking at this, we think that there could be some, some indication from very basic blood markers, particularly triglycerides. The reason we suspect that is because triglycerides are to some degree a, a good proxy for how carb tolerant someone is. You know, if we have, for example, someone with really high triglycerides, and I've, I've dealt with patients who have triglycerides in the double digits to the point where you look at their blood, shake it up, it looks like strawberry milkshake, right? There's so much fat in the blood. Oh. To, to lower triglycerides that are that high, there, there really is no other option but to put them on a low-carb diet. That's the most effective intervention by far. And so we think that there are enough indications to suspect that the higher triglycerides, the lower the carbs you should be on, um, obviously if you have really good triglycerides and your other blood measures, blood lipids and HbA1c or, or your average blood glucose look great, then it's, it's likely that you'll, um, not just tolerate, but benefit from an addition of carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. now, obviously there's another factor in there as well, which is that irrespective of whether you follow a low carb diet or a high carb diet, if you do more activity, you're going to require more carbohydrate. Now that's really misunderstood because people think that that means, well, if I'm an athlete, I need to be eating high carbs, but that's not the case because you might be at rest following a low carb diet, but that low carb diet can include an addition of carbohydrate and still be low carb, but satisfy the additional carb requirements that you have um, for that higher intensity activity, the glycolytic anaerobic type, type activities you do. And there are great examples of people who follow that sort of carb appropriate approach, I guess, like Dr. Dan Plews, who smashed the um, Masters Ironman world record, uh, who's also a researcher and he's a researcher in low carb. And so he's a guy that sort of walks the practice. But a lot of people in the low carb field become very zealous about it and they say, oh, Dan's a low carb athlete, so he eats basically no carbs mm. and he still manages to smash this record. No, it's not the case at all. Yeah. It's relative to energy out output. Yeah, no, 100%. I think, uh, again, it's that it, what, everyone's got to give something a label. Um, it's like, oh, he's, 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 you, what camp are you in? You know, are you in the plant based? <clears throat> are you in the, the low carb? Are you in the high carb? It's like, hey, I'm not in any camp. I just migrate or, you know, perhaps move between them depending on, you know, individuality, specificity, my requirements, what works for me, what yeah. works for the athlete, um, which, I, which I think is what you explained very well at the start about, again, having that sort of whole approach. It's not about being biased because they are all tools at the end of the day in the tool belt. And just because you've got a hammer doesn't mean everything's a nail, um, so, so to speak. Well, exactly. And I think we've actually done ourselves a bit of a disservice in – and over categorizing things. You know, I often get the question, well, what's the difference between keto and low carb? I say, well, it, there doesn't really have to be one because they're, they're both arbitrary anyway. But people assume that if you're producing ketones, you're, you're in ketosis and you must be on a ketogenic diet. But that's, that's ridiculous too because we always produce ketones. Every one of us is producing ketones, right? Um, to the point where I've seen some suggestion in the research lately that people are saying, well, ketones are absolutely essential within the body, just like glucose is. But the essentiality is, is far lower, right? Because if you're following a standard Western-style diet, you'll probably produce about 0.1 or 0.2 millimoles as your average. 
well, that's what you'll have in your blood at least, 0.1 to 0.2 millimoles per liter of beta-hydroxybutyrate, that ketone. Um, whereas nutritional ketosis is 0.5 millimoles. Now, people then think that, well, if I want to be on a ketogenic diet, it needs to be extraordinarily high in fat, very low in protein, and almost no carbohydrate. But we've demonstrated in our research that people can achieve ketosis on a range of plans. And some people need to be more restrictive and some people can have fairly moderate low carb plans and still be in ketosis. And also I need to say that does everyone need to be in ketosis if they're following a low carb diet? Not necessarily because if let's say you're not exhibiting levels over 0.5 millimoles, but you're performing well, you're feeling great and you're achieving your results. Who cares? I mean, the functional outcomes are so much more important than these, these markers and measures that people place a huge amount of, of importance on. Mm. No, fascinating stuff. And I think that's where, you know, there's not necessarily just hard lines between things. Um, you know, the lines can get blurry, but everything is kind of undulating, carries on to each other. Where I think, again, it's this, like people go, it's on, off, it's clean, dirty, it's bad, it's good. It's like, well, maybe it's not. Maybe it's kind of like, right. I always say, you know, I always use the clients, I said it's undulating, right? It's always moving. You know, it's not about, you know, people come in and go, I had a shit week, Alex. I'm like, did you have a shit week or did you just have a good week? And then you have a better week and you have the best week. You know, it's not really yeah. a bad week. You know, it's all about that kind of frame control and, look, and, and you know, kind of reframing it and changing the perspective and going, look, this, it, you know, it's not good or bad. You know, it's just where, where did we go wrong? Where do we need more support? What can we do better? But what did we improve on as well? You know, yeah. and I'd like to talk about, Cliff, before I move on to, to perhaps a, a different kind of point, still within the realms of nutrition and whatnot, but um, adherence factors um, and, and how you improve adherence when you're challenged with it. And I'm going to give you a couple of real life examples that I have found challenging over my years of coaching. And again, piecing it together, and I think you made some great points before about, again, making those changes between, okay, perhaps we need to go back to just look at energy balance and look if someone is going to be more adherent and, and they can eat ad libitum by, again, changing and not going, hey, well, you don't necessarily have a carbon fat goal. Let's kind of set a protein threshold along with a caloric kind of threshold. But then from there, as long as you hit your calories, like this is fine because technically we're going to be in a deficit. I think another example is, you know, a lot of people go, I, I, Alex, I don't want to eat breakfast. I'm like, that's fine. And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, you don't have to. And they're like, but I was, you have to eat. I'm like, you don't have to eat bread. Like break fast. You're breaking your fat. And they're like, what do you mean? And I'm like, look, generally, generally, you know, three kind of meals for general health is what's prescribed. But at the end of the day, you know, I talk to people about this hierarchy and obviously, you know, um, we know Eric and, and the nutritional pyramid and, and kind of explaining it in that realm, but perhaps could you give me some examples of how with your experience uh, and perhaps walk me through the process when you work with a client. And, and again, I know it's individualistic. Um, so it might be giving us a few examples rather than one where you would walk a client that is perhaps struggling with adherence um, struggling to lose weight and it might be again some chronically obese clients it might be some clients who are perhaps you know a little bit more versed or well versed in nutrition and how you overcome that and what that process looks like please yeah so you're right it is individual and i will talk about one interesting aspect that came out of some of our research on that but overall there, there are there are still key things i think that translate across most people, you know, I think um, most pragmatic practitioners nowadays do recognize the the very important uh, the, the importance of individuality, but that's not at, that doesn't preclude the fact that we are you know to, to a large degree genetically identical as you know humans within the species, and so there are going to be a lot of things that translate across us so with adherence, I think that some of the bigger challenges we have is that it's very difficult for people to exercise control by willpower over a long period of time. And that's compounded by, if, if they're trying to exercise control through formulaic plans that don't educate them and that don't encourage the, the habits of behavior that make, make it more or less semi-autonomic what they're doing, then we're going to have big drop-offs. So 
I always try and look at it with the client first as an education process and it starts almost philosophically. You know, it's like the, the concepts of nutrition. And the first one is, hey, we want to eat more natural, unrefined food. And I try to give them visuals for that. You know, let's, let's try and make sure that when we're looking at a plate, it has, you know, at least 80, 90% plus unrefined foods on it. And they start to get that sort of visual there. Um, I think the next sort of barrier to adherence is that people just don't know how to structure meals without sort of quantification, looking at the back of packets and trying to fit into sort of macro models and things. And I don't think that's always the, the best approach to have as, as the first and foremost one. It, it works, no doubt, and it works really well for some people, but I think across the board, what I try and work with first is that philosophy first of unrefined food. Then, what does a meal look like? And how can we begin to get a, a mind's eye view of a modular approach to meal planning? What I mean by that, and I'll often work out the calories behind the scenes first, but it might be that there's a very simple portion sort of idea. So that might be, for example, two palm-sized servings of a protein food, three fist sizes of vegetables, um, one thumb size of fat or oil, and that's a meal, right? If someone requires some extra carbohydrate, then it might also be, hey, and if, you've, if you're still hungry after all of that, here's some nice, whole, unrefined carbohydrate choices that you can potentially add in as well. Now, by doing that, I know it seems a little bit imprecise to some degree, but I'm really trying to teach people that when they're eating well, they tend to auto-regulate well as well. You know, we, we certainly see that from a lot of the research. When people are following nutrition plans that are based on a compendium of natural unrefined food, they tend to have pretty good auto-regulation. So I at least want to get that in first. And it also means that they're more resilient when it comes to, oh, no, I don't have my plan in front of me, or I'm, I'm out and about and I need to buy something, rather than, oh, no, I don't have the, the gram quantities. I can actually see, okay, this is kind of roughly what I want based on the portions and the modular approach to meals that I've, uh, that I've learned. From there, I, I will often also give people specific like meal ideas, you know, so this is what your daily calorie intake should be. And this is what it actually looks like for, let's say breakfast. It's this amount of a protein food, or let's say for lunch, you know, it's 150 grams of lean meat or fish or chicken. And again, three for size servings of vegetables and X amount of tablespoons of added oil and blah, blah, blah. So we're going from the general down to specific. And I think with that gamut, they really start to understand, um, you know, again, within their mind's eye, what good nutrition looks and feels like. And that's, I, I think, a really key po uh, point for then encouraging longer-term adherence. One other thing, of course, is I, I think meal frequency is a, a big aspect of that. Um, I, I personally feel that for most people, uh, the, the idea of meals and snacks. I mean, we know from the evidence that snacking um, typically promotes poorer food choices. So I tend to go with a, a, a meals, not snacks approach. And really as few meals as is necessary to accomplish your goals. So for a lot of people that might only be, you know, two, maybe three meals a day uh, is completely fine. Now, there's a couple of things that happen there. That might mean that there's slightly longer fasting periods, which helps with auto-regulation. Because for a lot of people, it's easier just to not eat than to worry about what they're going to eat. And then to eat more or less ad libitum within their actual meals. Um, but the other thing that a lot of people don't consider within that is that with fewer meals, it feels a lot easier. You know, if I'm going to think about, well, I've got lunch and dinner to have tomorrow, and especially if I've over-prepared um, last night, last night's dinner, so I've got leftovers for lunch. I've really only got to worry about one meal today, right? As compared to the old mentality, which was breakfast, snack, lunch, snack, dinner, snack. That just gives me anxiety thinking about it. Fuck, what am I going to prepare? You know, I've got to prepare all these meals and I've got to have healthy snacks ready to go and all this kind of stuff. For a lot of people, that's just when they start to immediately, you can see it in their body language in clinic. I'm sure you have. They start to go, oh, shit, this is too much. Whereas when you say, hey, you know what we're going to do? Here's an example. We're going to um, make sure you prepare dinner 
really well because let's face it, you're home at night, you're already preparing dinner, let's change that around a little bit. And guess what? You do two meals worth, you've got lunch the following day. And let's say, um, to make it really easy, assuming they're not fasting through the morning, you want to have a really simple on-the-go option for breakfast. Let's just have a really good nutrient-dense smoothie. You've got three fantastic meals there, and it's taken you basically no time to prepare. That makes things a lot easier for people. So I think we really need to get the, the actionable steps that people can do to make it easier, because those are the things that really help to drive adherence. Yeah, no, correct. And again, it's there's that dichotomy between, you know, oh, you know, I've got to I've got to eat a certain amount of food, or, or or what do I actually need to eat? you know versus again the misconceptions of oh, i've got to have six meals a day and i got to, and it just becomes overfacing. and i guess the, the the real dichotomy there is from what i've found is you either get two types of individuals and it's give me a meal plan just give me a meal plan tell me exactly what to eat gram it down to the thing and then you get the the opposite side where it's like you know um oh, I, I, I don't want to track anything. I don't want to, do, you know, and it's like, well, yeah, okay, we won't do that. And I think a lot of practitioners go straight with a lot of clients from nothing to here is a meal plan and it's this cookie cutter sort of something they put together and it's like, well, hang on, there's a massive gap there and this is something I've learned the hard way where, you know, for most people it's like, let's just do a food diary. Like, let me just see what yeah. your habits and behaviors are because we don't necessarily have to reinvent the wheel. And I really like those, and again, to kind of go back and highlight those points about what you were saying with meal frequency, I think that's really important, and using those basic visual measures, which might seem ambiguous um, to people, but that's where it needs to start a lot of the time, because for most people, they're not going to get out my fitness pal, they're not going to track, it is a tool, I always say it's a tool when used wisely, it can be fantastic, but when used incorrectly, it can cause more harm than good. Um, and then when people are out, like you said, they, they panic. They're like, oh, I don't have my app with me. I, I can't track it. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We've built these habits and behaviors. You visually know. And a lot of those things auto-regulate. As you said, Cliff, clients go, oh, I, you know, how, are you, how are you going with the food? How do you feel on it? How's digestion? How's satiation? I'm not craving anything, actually, yeah. Alex. Funny that, now reading more qualitative whole foods, you know, those deficiencies perhaps are bridged. They're not craving things. They're moving well. Their adherence is improving because, again, ironically, now they're feeling better. They're seeing more results. They're working harder, and it's kind of like snowball effect. How do you yeah. set expectations with clients when perhaps clients come to you with this whole, like, hey, Cliff, are you just, can you just give me a meal plan? Can I just pay you for a meal plan? And it's like, okay, will you – and this person, let's say, for example, doesn't need one, um, or perhaps they've not got the basics versus someone who is just like, I don't want to track anything. I have, like, no idea, and they're living on Cocoa Pops and Red Bull, which on my studies we had a person who was doing that. Uh, <laughs> quite ironically. Um, Sounds good. Yeah, yeah. It was an example they used uh, when I was – Sounds good for a day. Winter, yeah, yeah. The person ended up in hospital. You know, oh, she's, she's, she's really lean, though. She's healthy. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's not what she's eating. It's also what she's not eating, the, the nutrients. But that, that is a true story, actually. She's, yeah. she's all right now, but – Students, mate. Students. Um, <laughs> what are yeah? What are some of the um, like? What does that look like, or what does that verbal communication look like? And how do you? Because I think a lot of clients come, and this is again, this is a challenge, and I'm putting this out because it's something I faced. It's real, where I'm sitting down with a client, and they're expecting, you know, with coaching, cool. Like I'm getting this amazing training program. Like I'm going to be squat, bench, and deading, and all of this, and it's like. I've not even taught you how to move properly yet, you know, and, and they just expect this amazing meal plan. And again, it's like, well, this is going to be too much for you. You don't even know, you know, energy balance yet. And again, keyword education, that is yeah. where I'm trying to go with this. I always say, look, I'm not going to smash. I'm going to educate you. I'm going to teach you how to do this yourself to a degree, but it's going to take time. It's kind of hard. I'm against the grain when I'm sat around a lot of personal trainers who, you know, I'm sat at the front a lot of the time, like as a practitioner. And I, I mean, I spent an hour yesterday just, you know, educating my client on nutrition. We didn't even get in the gym. We didn't even move, you know, but mm. a lot of those clients over time, they value that they see that, but a lot of clients can come and go, well, you know, we're just going to go in the gym and make me sweat and just give me a meal plan. 
how do you, yeah. if you have faced that challenge yourself, get around and set that expectation and go, hey, look, if we're going to do things from a more pragmatic standpoint and we're going to do things which I always say are sustainable, flexible, and enjoyable, because if you don't tick those boxes, in my belief, it's never going to work, um, to, yeah. to kind of get the, and as you said before, kind of like the buy-in from the client. Um, and I know there's a little bit of trust and, and faith that comes with that book. In your experience, what have you found? It's a really great question, and I think you hit the nail on the head. It does come down to education. Now, I'm not just going to leave it at that because you know the, the, the listeners will be thinking, "Well, that's <laughs> it doesn't mean anything at this point because just education." Mm. Um, but I think that the key thing there is that it's education, but it's education that actually cuts through. So I think sometimes as practitioners, we almost need to do it under the cover of darkness to some degree. If someone comes to me and they say, well, I, I want a, I, I just want a menu plan. That's all I want. I will say to them, well, look, th this is what I can include within your plan. And I'll show them an example. Like this is what I basically do. I, I tend to not do sort of seven day meal plans or 30 day meal plans because I, I honestly believe that in most cases they don't work because, you know, you come to, let's say, Monday breakfast and you're supposed to have one particular meal. You don't have the ingredients for that meal. Suddenly it creates all this confusion. So I tend to have menu exemplars that have a number of different options that are somewhat modular. Uh, so it might be, you know, X amount of grams of this plus vegetables plus X amount of grams of oil or whatever. So maybe some different ways to prepare that, but it's still fairly modular. If they don't have salmon, they can choose chicken. If they don't have chicken, they can choose steak. If they don't have lettuce, they can use cow, whatever, you know. Um, so I basically show them that and say, is this going to work for you? Because I'm going to customize this to you, but I'm also going to give you the, the general tools that precede that, that are going to help you to make better decisions when you don't always have your plan in front of you. So I basically walk them through what a plan from me looks like and how in depth it can be or how simple it can be and basically see whether that's going to fit for them. And if, if it just isn't going to fit, then I'll basically refund them because um, they people prepay for consultations with me and refer them on to someone who might be able to be a better fit. Um, however, I can't remember that ever having happened. Uh, typically, people are pretty happy. The only things that I've seen happen, and this is probably over 23 years, maybe two or three instances at most, um, sometimes people just simply are not happy with the plan I've given them. Mm. I'll give you an I'll give you two examples actually because Please. they're quite they're quite funny. I had a a client, international client, with multiple pathologies and multiple uh, pot poly pharma use. So basically a lot of medications and a lot of pathologies going on. I was quite comfortable working with this person because I felt like the, the particular disorders were well within my wheelhouse. Um, obviously, it's within my scope of practice to do that. It's a lot of what I do nowadays in terms of nutritional consulting is work with very complex cases. So uh, we went through a process. The consultation went fantastically. I explained exactly what I was going to do. And um, then when I put the plan together, she, uh, the, the client was very happy. When I put the plan together, I sent it through. And the client got back in touch and said, um, I, I, basically, I want more supplements in the plan. And I, I said, well, look, there are a number of things we can do. We have aces up our sleeve, but because of the drugs you're using, I have to be very aware, and it's, it's my, basically, position of safety for you that we need to be very clear on food, drug, herb, supplement interactions, and they could be considerable in this particular case. So this is why we're starting with the foundations. And I think the reality is that the client saw the plan and thought, this looks too simple. But it was simple, not stupid. It was a simple and effective plan to cover off the foundations that weren't being covered that actually would have had an enormous impact on that person's health. Uh, they chose to stop uh, seeing me as a consultant because of that, because they simply wanted more in the plan rather than less. And they particularly wanted, um, you know, dare I say it, pills and potions that could potentially be the silver bullet. Um, but that becomes 
very dangerous at that point when you're looking at you know five different medications and then you're throwing in all these other things on top that could really have detrimental effects there. And so that was a, a really good example of you, you just can't please everybody. And in that case, I was quite happy just to step away and say, cool, look, uh, I you know wish you the best and I hope you find a practitioner that can work in the way you need them to. Um, another uh, example was I walked someone through the process of what I would pres uh, prescribe to them or the way it would sort of look. And once I had done the plan, it took quite a lot of time because, again, there was some, some complexity to this case. The, the client then came back and said, oh, could I have a seven-day meal plan? And I, I didn't want to do it because I thought, I don't think this is going to be effective, but I actually did it anyway. I wrote up a full seven-day meal plan, basically according to what they wanted, but that would also work, right? Then they came back and said, oh, I don't think that's enough. I really need a month of meals. <laughs> so like a 30-day plan. And at that stage, I said, look, I, I just don't think it's worth your, your time um, because that's going to you know, obviously cost more for me to do that. And I, I really don't think you're going to get results from that. So maybe we should just um, take a break and you might need to find someone else to work with you. <laughs> yeah. Well, wow. like I say, there's probably one other instance through, you know, over two decades in practice where it, it hasn't worked out. Um, the rest of the time, we tend to get, you know, pretty good results and pretty good adherence. Yeah, no, I appreciate you sharing those real life examples as well, because, you know, I think it's good for, you know, I enjoy listening to it. It's great for the practitioners as well to kind of realize that, you know, it's not always about perfection. You don't always get the win. You, you, you know, you do not connect with everybody sometimes. And I think, you know, always putting the onus on yourself and go, well, what can I do better? But then obviously knowing, you know, sometimes it, perhaps it's not what I've done or what I'm going to do. It's just this person is perhaps not there in an education sense. Perhaps they're one of the outliers and in whatever behavioral aspect you want to look at. And again, that will go down the rabbit hole of psychology. But I think, um, for, for some people, again, to use examples as well, similar, and, and listening to what you're saying and they're reminding me of some, some you know, clients that I've worked with, some, I struggle sometimes to, to kind of get it across. I'm, I'm, I'm fairly well like, communicating to most people, but I always, you get the odd person who just, there was a person who just wanted to pay me for it. It was just the meal plan, just the training, and he kept, he wasn't almost listening to what I was saying. He's like, no, no, just, 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 you know, just, just do me a little, you know, like he didn't really know what he wanted. And I said, you know, you got to go away and think about what you really want um, after giving him some sort of like context and frame. But he kept coming back and did the same thing. And he was sort of hanging on to this notion of this, again, it's the, what I call the silver bullet, the magic pill mentality, where it was, you know, if you just give me a meal plan, if you just give me a set number, like a workout plan, it's going to work. And I said to him, look, there's, there's no, I said, I'm not going to take money off you and I don't promote, like, again, I don't have it on my website, like buy a meal plan off me. That's because I don't personally believe in it based on what I'm learning. I think they're a tool and there's a time and a place, um, which goes yeah. contrary against a lot of our Instagram heroes um, who are just pumping them out and taking money off people. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's a numbers game. But the thing is, you know, that only lasts so long and people get burnt. But, you know, he was sort of, I was trying to say to him, look, like if you felt like the devil's in the details here, I said, you want people fear that, you know, they are going to be, they want a meal plan, but then they also fear, oh, I'm going to be eating the same thing every day. And maybe perhaps like that gentleman you're working with, he's like, I want a month. I said, well, look, let's look at the reality. Most humans are creatures of habit. I said, this is the power of creating awareness. and tracking. <clears throat> if you initially track your food, you're actually going to see these patterns that evolve in it, whether they're good habits or bad yeah. habits. And people are actually quite unawares of it. And I said, then the food variety is key. But again, it's this whole fear, like these false expectations appearing real and go, oh, you need to reinvent every meal and become Jamie Oliver. No. Going back to an example you used before, you know, you give people, hey, look, in the morning, I want you to have a serving of this, this, and this. But again, it's modular. It's, it's changing. It's dynamic. It's adaptive. You know, I say, for example, you see right now five ingredients. I see 10 recipes that you can do with that. With the same ingredients, you could dehydrate the oats. You could cook the oats. You could blend the oats. You could make them into a pancake. And then all of a sudden, people go, and I'm like, right. So I don't expect people to know that, but I'm like, now let's think laterally. So now you're eating the same ingredients in the same calorie threshold every day. But if you really wanted to, you could make those into all different meals. The irony is you won't. You'll actually yeah. stick with one for a week and then you'll change it. And then even if you do change it, yeah. just change one element. Hey, you know what? You use blueberries, maybe use mangoes, right? Okay, that's, that's, a, that's a small change. I don't know that's simple, but I think yeah. kind of like that 
in itself is a, as an example of that specificity where people are just overthinking it all the time. And then going back to the example with the gentleman, I said, look, I can give you, I said, you can Google any of these plans. I said, and my plan may be different in the specificity. He said, but I said, if I include these movements, I still need to teach you how to do them because based on where you're at, you're already doing these movements. You're just not doing them effectively, efficiently, you know, or safely. I said, so you can give me, a, you know, $100, $120 for this exercise program, the nutrition program. I said, but I need to sit down and educate you on how to apply it. So it's like me giving you a samurai sword it's one of the best weapons in the world, hand-to-hand -hand combat, but you don't know how to use it. But people don't get that <laughs> because they are constantly, right, they're going, no, no, I just, I just need these magic exercises. I said, so you think pretty much I'm going to give you yeah. a certain split, which is going to have a magic rep range, some magic numbers, and you're going to get jacked. I said, if that was the case, 80% of people in any commercial gym would be far more developed. You know, like moving weight is one thing. Learning to activate the muscles and move effectively is something completely different. Again, I've gone off on a tangent, but I'm passionate about it. Um, so I think, again, no, like, it, you, you make a great point. Mm, these um, these, these, these um, gray areas. Are, no, go on, continue. No, sorry. I was just... Um, no, jump in, jump in, go for it. You make a fantastic point because I think we can fall into the trap and we can all do this, but we can fall into the trap of, of really over-focusing on the what without having the why first, which provides the context and then the how, which is the application, you know, the compelling why, um, that the how becomes the most important thing really, that the what's obviously important in terms of plan prescription, but the how is important, like you mentioned, if you are telling someone to go in and do German volume training and do 10 sets of 10 squats with a heavy weight, you, you hope that they know how to squat well. Um, similarly, people can let concepts get in the way where they'll hear certain things and they'll, they'll give too much primacy to that. A, a really good example of that is variety. You know, in, in nutrition, people think, oh, well, variety is really important. I think variety is important, but only if you've got consistency first. You can't have variety without consistency. And you would have seen this as well, I'm sure. You know, people who think, oh, well, I need, I'm going to start eating well. I'm going to go to the supermarket and pick up all of these things that I've never cooked with before. I'm going to get some kohlrabi and some collard greens and all the stuff that I've never cooked before and take it home. It sits in the fridge and just rots. They throw it out and they go back to what they've always eaten. So if we can get people initially eating, like you said, the things that maybe they're already familiar with, but with consistency to good quality nutrition and appropriate energy intake, then, you know, I love what you said about that. Let's make a small change here. Let's try using mango instead of blueberries. Or let's try using raspberries instead of blueberries. Or let's try a different grain instead of oats, you know, just for, for, for a change. And that way people start to increase their food compendium as well, but it's built on consistency. Yeah, no, 100%. That's a great point um, to highlight as well. And again, I think it comes from that place of fear. Some people, it's, you know, analysis by paralysis or opposite way around, whatever it might be. But again, it's, I say, I say to people, you know, when we sit down every week, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not your mother. I'm not going to tell you off. All I want you to do is apply and have a go at what we've talked about. I said, because then we can problem solve it every week and move forward. I said, look, and you're not going to get it right. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to find something that works. You're going to find something that doesn't. But the, and, and, you know, people go, oh, what did, you know, what did Jake do? And what has, you know, Monique done to achieve the results? And I said, and all they've done, I said, it comes down to one thing and it's attitude, you know, and it's just the willingness to go, I'm going to be open to this. I'm going to try it, you know, and we're going to, we're going to just keep progressing. And some weeks we're going to, you know, it's going to be better than others. And that's just the way it is. But again, sort of breaking it down into bite-sized chunks. Um, but yeah, I guess a lot to unpack, uh, unpack mm -hmm. there, but some great examples as well, Cliff. So thank you for sharing. To transition a little bit now, because I would like to talk about this, because um, I know there's quite a, a few people that are affected by this, and, and even some clients that I've worked with as well, um, within the realms of Crohn's disease. Now, this is something that has affected your life. Um, could you perhaps talk about, maybe define for people who are not aware of what that is, what it is, how it affects the body, and perhaps what you've learned from it and any carryovers that has helped you create better relationships with nutrition and actually coach others from some of the lessons that it's taught you like indirectly. Yeah. Um, so Crohn's disease is one of the inflammatory bowel disorders or one of the inflammatory bowel diseases, I should say. 
um, along with the other, other major one being ulcerative colitis. And basically, they're chronic inflammatory autoimmune conditions. So the, the body is launching uh, some type of immune response uh, and also potentially um, bacteria or, or other aspects of the microbiome within the gut, which is causing a lot of inflammatory damage to the gut itself. And there's also systemic damage that occurs through that increase in inflammatory markers uh, or inflammatory cytokines through the body. So basically you get damage to the gut. Uh, the the old ramping bloating, um, there can obviously be bleeding if the disease is active and the, the worst effect of it would be bowel perforation, which is a medical emergency. Um, thankfully, now with, with modern treatments, that's relatively rare and the, the fatality rate or mortality rate of uh, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis is, is very low. Um, but back pre, pre-treatment, pre um, it was relatively high. And so there can obviously be other systemic effects as well, ranging from arthritis through to increased rates of depression and other mental health challenges because obviously inflammation is a key and no inf- factor now in, in mental health disorders. And so there's a lot of other things that can be going on too. Um, I was diagnosed, I think, when I was about 20 or so. And um, it was a, a real eye-opener because I think anyone who's diagnosed with a, a chronic and, and purportedly incurable condition, it, it's it's really uh, because everything else that you experience up to that point is, is pretty much a cold or maybe a flu-like virus. And you know, even though you feel like you're at death's door, you know it's only going to be days or weeks away before you're back to normal. Uh, whereas when you've got to deal with something day day by day for the rest of your life, that can be very daunting. Uh, um, one interest when I was diagnosed, I contacted the support group here at the time. I think they've changed their form a lot. But, um, and I asked, well, and I was already in practice actually at the time, but I, I asked, is there any information you have on nutrition for, for Crohn's? Because I the basic information that they had that they would send out to people. And the representative said, well, th- there is no information because diet doesn't play a role in Crohn's. Now, I thought that didn't really make a lot of sense because obviously we've got an intestinal disorder to some degree. Sure, it's systemic, but it's, you know, um, the, the main effects are felt in the gut. So you would suspect that there was some role for food. Now, I- even outside of that, my baseline ideology, I guess, is that if the body is healthier, it is going to be more resilient in the face of illness. Now, the, the proof of the pudding there is that if something is just purely based on, say, genes or an interaction between genes and some other factors and you, you develop a disease or disorder, it's going to be there all the time, right? But with almost all diseases like this, any of, particularly the autoimmune inflammatory disorders, you will see periods of relapse and remission. So people will get worse, they'll have disease activity, and there are times when they're in remission when they don't. So that shows that there's more going on. So in a nutshell, um, obviously I've done a lot of research in this area, and you know I, I develop, for example, you know I teach clinical nutrition, so I teach uh, nutritional medicine for specific diseases and disorders. We take a, a, an inductive approach to that, so I look at the research, and basically anything with strong evidence we'll use as nutritional medicine. The key thing that team seems to come through time and time again is that it is very holistic. You know, sleep plays a role because lack of sleep and poor quality sleep drives inflammation. It has a compounding effect on stress, which drives inflammation. Stress itself, you know, is a negative cofactor for this. Uh, and then obviously a diet that is overall based on natural unprocessed food tends to be pretty much the way to go. Um, There are some exclusions that tend to work best for, let's say, most people most of the time with with Crohn's or colitis. And those are typically the the, the common allergens. You know, we tend to see that there there might be some link there with gluten, for example. Although that's a very polarized debate as well, because some people Mm, will say, well, if you're not celiac, you, you can eat wheat um, or the other gluten containing grains. Whereas, I would look at it as, well, yes, probably more people than necessary are following gluten-free diets. They, they maybe don't need to, and there might be other factors going on. But 
there is enough evidence across a number of disorders to show that a gluten-free diet might benefit, you know, particularly those autoimmune inflammatory conditions. And so it, it makes sense to, to restrict that or exclude it and see what happens. Um, there might also be negative effects from casein, from dairy, uh, carrageenan, which is a common food additive, and then other things as well that can potentially have um, cause challenges for people with intestinal diseases, like uh, even corn flour can be problematic for some people. But when you start getting into exclusions, it is relatively variable depending on the individual. So um, overall, I'm, I'm probably talking around in circles here a little bit, but the, the, the key really is that I think for any health condition, the base is still to, to try and provide for and preserve those foundations of health because then we tend to be the most resilient. We can obviously really go down the rabbit hole with other things. You know, I'm a big, um, I have a huge interest in the whole idea of, of, of aging, uh, which I think is actually a key thing across all diseases and disorders. So there are certain things that we um, are looking at there that might have an impact on a number of diseases as well. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps we can transition into that and, and you know, unpack it a little bit because and thank you for the overview. Um, and it is something where for the lot of, a lot of the time it may be, as you said, it's specific, it's individual, a lot of trial and error um, to a degree. Obviously, there's, there's the hard lines and what is and what isn't. But again, for, for individuals who perhaps are not as knowledgeable or might not have a background with nutrition, I think, you know, for them, it can be a little bit daunting and finding what works for their body and kind of being your own scientist as, as well as obviously perhaps partnering up with a, a, you know, a sound practitioner who can give you a little bit of a roadmap and then learn to kind of give you those skill sets yeah. to go, okay, well, how's my body feeling? How's it reacting and not demonizing perhaps a specific food because it might be not the food itself. It might be what the food contains um, rather than just going, well, I can't eat that food. That's bad. It's like, well, hang on. No, no, no. Like, let maybe have a look at what's within the food. And again, not necessarily having to become a rocket scientist because I think that scares a few people, but knowing that, yeah. well, if you've got a chronic disease, um, like unfortunately, my mom has MS and, you know, and one of the practitioners she worked with just said, hey, look, like Tina, this is just going to force you to be super healthy. Like you've, you've like, you've got to be like really on top of your shit. And I thought that was a really positive way to frame it. And that was something yeah. that always sort of stuck out of my mind. And I think that can kind of help people go, well, you know what? Yeah, it's not great that you've got this, but it is what it is. Let's, let's make the best of it and um, use the tools that we have. Perhaps. You, do you want to talk about the aging, um, perhaps some of the, the key points there? And, and I don't know, I'm going to jump ahead. Are you referring to aging as in like when we are now thinking of aging itself is a disease rather than it just being a natural process of the body? Yeah, exactly. I, I think that's, you know, part of the, the shift is that we're starting to see aging as a disease. And we're starting to look within aging as, at, at what is actually happening. And it's, it's breakdown of of tissue, you know, and, and dysfunctional cells. And really that rests on this epigenome to, to genome interplay. And the, the reason I think that's important for disease and disorder overall is most illnesses, I think, we, we could say that there is some aspect of that. But the reason I say that is that irrespective of when you're, whether you're diagnosed with an illness at, at 8 or 18 or 28 or 58, it's likely that there are some processes there of impaired gene signaling, you know, epigenetic consequences. There's some interplay of environment, epigenome, and genetic stuff going on, which is impacted by the degradation of those processes. Now, one thing that I think is super interesting is that similar, similar cofactors that can cause either relapse or, or help to encourage remission will do that differently in different people. You know, for example, your, your mum, similar factors that might cause me to go into relapse for Crohn's disease might cause her to go into relapse for MS, where there's greater disease activity. The, the cofactors are the same. The difference is that there's a, there's a signal there, that there's a difference in that transmission through that sort of epigenome into the genetic and cellular consequences. So, where I'm sort of heading with that is that we have this idea of aging. It's very Victorian. We kind of think about ourselves as, as if we're like steam locomotives, you know, trucking on, 
and then eventually you have a machine running too long, it starts to break down, right? That's not really correct when it comes to the human being because we, like any complex organism, are self-replicating, self-recreating machines. So we're not just a machine that's running and breaking down. We're recreating ourselves moment by moment. So if we're starting to see dysfunction over time, it's because there is either one of two things, really. I know I'm oversimplifying, but it's really one of two things. We either don't have the building blocks, the, the inputs that, re that are required to actually build the, the structural and functional tissue or messengers, all that kind of stuff, or the software is broken. In other words, that epigenome into genetic um, signaling it is somehow impaired. And so I think we're now starting to see how overall good health, um, you know, things like sleep, stress, sun exposure, but also nutrition in terms of getting enough energy, getting enough of the building blocks, protein, carbohydrates, fats, essential vitamins and minerals, and then the secondary nutrients that could be really important for actually helping to signal certain processes within the body. And typically they end up being, to, to some degree, hormetic stress signals. You know, like our, for example, antioxidants that we get from brightly colored vegetables and berries and things, are, are they exerting most of their beneficial effect because they're antioxidants? Or is it because they're also signals from our environment that there is heat stress? You know, you, you, I don't know, I, I grow chilies and tomatoes. You give them lots of water and they're in a fairly nice sort of ambient environment, they grow really well, but hey, the best way to ripen them is to give them a bit of water stress and a lot of heat stress and a lot of sun, even to the point where the leaves begin to wilt and bang, they're producing those antioxidant chemicals which are bright red and all that kind of stuff, so you get this ripening. But we read those signals on a genetic cellular level as, okay, there's stress in the environment, we need to get ready for that. And this starts to kick in some of the positive catabolic processes similar to what happens when we have saunas and heat shock, um, cold exposure, even fasting. You know, the effects of fasting on reducing monocyte-driven inflammation and encouraging uh, reduced IGF-1 and all that kind of stuff, these are hormetic signals that basically help to change um, some of those aging processes and reduce that degradation on a cellular level. So there are some really interesting things that we're looking into. I, I'm experimenting with NAD boosters and various flavanols, quercetin and resveratrol and stuff like that. And, and we're actually looking to do a lot more research in that space um, because the, there's a big disconnect between, at the moment, the animal research on aging and the human research. And a lot of what looks really good in the animal research is not really being demonstrated in the human research. But I think there's a, a potential issue there, which is the time. Right, and this could be a temporal problem where, let's say we have a three-month trial in mice, that's a large proportion of their lifespan. We have a three-month trial in humans, which is typically, you know, the, the sort of proxy time because it's, it's relatively easy to do, but it's long enough to see some effects. That's not much of a human lifespan. So when we're looking at aging and slow processes of degradation, perhaps we need uh, longer trials or we need to look at the research in a slightly different way. So that's what we're, we're really looking into now is how we can do that um, and how we can see whether these, these things that are purported to work in the animal research are actually going to translate to the human experience. Mm. Yeah, no, that's, it's super interesting stuff. And I think like, in and of itself, uh, there's so many things to unpack and, uh, I know um, a few people might be familiar with Dave, David Sinclair. And I think there's a lot of, you know, neuroscientists now, different practitioners who are, you know, researching this space. Even, for example, um, Matthew Walker, you know, we talk about sleep and all the different sort of categories and interventions and how they all kind of correlate to that aging process. And it, and it is really fascinating. Yeah. And I think a lot of, a lot of the fascination, I guess, from, from people who are maybe having standing back from the curtain are a little bit like, oh, wow, like we, we can live longer and we, we, could, we, could we live forever? There's this like fantasy, right? Um, this vampiric um, <laughs> of, of fallacy, if you like. But um, it is nice. And I think also looking at not just longevity, but the, the, the like quality, the qualitative approach. Like we've all known someone who's perhaps lived yeah. you know, a long life, but 
was that last 20% of their life, was it quality? Like, you know, it's better exactly. to, to live more quality. And I think that is where a lot of this research is going to come in and perhaps fill these gaps so we can go, right, well, what is actually happening? You know, what, what are the mechanistics of it and, and what does affect the body? And again, I, <laughs> resveratrol and all of the, these sort of, um, I guess, experiments that are going on in research is it's quite fascinating. Um, and, and how it, like you said, how it affects animals versus humans and is that those carryovers and correlations. So, um, Definitely look forward to hearing more about that uh, from yourself and perhaps a lot of other practitioners because I think that work needs to be done, right? Um, there's some amazing yeah. amazing uh, people doing some amazing studies out there. And that's where I think we can be of value down here, you know, in Australia, but particularly in New Zealand because the, the reality is we, we don't often have the ability to run, you know, either very, very... Um, I guess very specific research like, you know, a la David Sinclair and people like that, because we, we simply don't have the the infrastructure in that particular field or the, the, the techniques or the equipment to do that. Um, similarly, it's difficult to run enormous trials because they just cost so much. Yeah. But I think that that's, you know, relative scarcity has driven a, a lot of really innovative research out of this part of the world because we're really focused on translation. And so I think we do really good translational research. So we basically see what's going on and, and see what's plausible. And then we actually show in, in real life, in real humans, what can potentially occur. Mm -hmm. And so to some degree, I, I guess that... Um, yeah, that, that scarcity can drive innovation. And, and I think that's a really important place for us to be. Uh, and it also means that, you know, I'm fairly straight up about the fact that I, I am a nutrition researcher. That, that's, that's it, right? I'm not a biochemist and I'm not a geneticist, but we can see what other scientists are doing and help to fill in parts of the puzzle from our particular sphere uh, without claiming to be experts in a particular area. You know, it's, it's very simple for me to look at particular things and say, hey, you know what, I'd love to see what happens in humans, in vivo, in situ, applying this thing as a supplement or applying this different dietary intervention. Let's just see what happens. Yeah, I, th I think you summed it up really well there, um, Cliff, in terms of, you know, you, we, we need people in all respective fields to be able to do this because if, <laughs> seldom do you meet someone who is very well versed in all of the areas and the degree and time that it would take to become so uh, up to speed and educated in all those facets is just not realistic. So I think like coming together and like you said, doing your part and obviously nutrition is a massive element to it. But even I think it's more so just finding something that you're passionate about and that you love and go, well, I'm going to go like, I'm not going to be closed minded. Like I'm going to be open minded and learn what I can, but I'm going to specialize in this area and I'm going to do the best work I can. So, you know, when and if the time comes and as it evolves, you can present that and go, well, hey, we've already, we've already trialed and we've already done this and perhaps now that's, that's going to be a key piece. And I think it is with nutrition because it's, like you said, it's got a massive, massive effect um, to, to what we do. It's something that's essential to the body to be able to sort of put that forward. Um, so, yeah, very exciting stuff indeed. Um, and now, I know we're coming to time and I'm very um, just – respectful of your time and I just want to keep that in mind so I appreciate it's all good. it it's all good. Um, and I think almost we need a round two here because there's, there's a lot of other um, sort of questions and avenues I think we could divulge down but before we go uh, before we go on to the, the, the questions I, I generally run through which are a bit more lighthearted perhaps can we talk a little bit about I know you've done a lot of traveling uh, I know you've lived overseas in Vancouver to name to name one of the places and you practiced over there I know you've written a few books Perhaps could you give us a bit of an overview on some of the travel that you've done and in essence of time, maybe a few places that really stick out in your mind and any sort of educational learnings or experiences which perhaps translate that you like to you know, pay it forward to other people, which you find generally helps them kind of perhaps you know, rethink or reframe some of the things they're doing in their life to enhance it? Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, I think... Like most people who have done a fair bit of travel, the, the biggest thing that it always does is it, it makes you appreciate where you're from. You know, particularly being from New Zealand, when I travel overseas, I'm so appreciative of, of what we have here. And people can misequate that to a, a sort of 
cavalier attitude of, oh, well, we've got it great here. We don't need to be active in changing things. It's certainly not that. It's, it's more so that when we see some of the challenges that are in our countries and we have a, a very safe country here that is, is quite progressive and it's very liberal and it has a lot of freedoms and it's, you know, recently been rated the least corrupt country in the world and all sorts of things. It, it's, it makes you very grateful. And so the overarching theme I think would be of, of their gratitude, but also being grateful for having seen cultural differences of, of where perhaps we can improve as individuals. You know, I, I remember very clearly uh, when I was living in Canada, I lived up there, I, I think for nearly five years, uh, I was work, living and working up in Vancouver and I, I was blown away at the cultural difference in, in Vancouver in particular between Auckland where I'm from and Vancouver. In New Zealand, I think one of the things we do quite well is we're very entrepreneurial and people are very good at, at just getting things done. You know, if something needs to be done, a, a lot of people, we have this entrepreneurial mindset where we just get it done. Uh -huh. That yeah. can translate though sometimes in the negative to you're so fixed on what you're doing that while you might appreciate what someone's doing you're kind of like oh yeah that's cool see how that works out kind of thing so you know you might talk to someone and say oh you know i've got this new thing going on it's it's really cool and they're like oh yeah good luck with that because they're just taking a wait and see approach right they're focused on what they're doing it's a very kiwi thing we're very much like that yeah. um whereas when i went up to canada i met with a few people and i said oh you know they say what are you doing um you know i'm a nutritionist and a strength coach and i'm uh, I've just started working up here and they're like, oh, that sounds really cool what you do. Tell me a little bit more about it. Tell them a little bit more about it and say, oh, you know what? You should meet this guy and this guy and this guy. And I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll call them now and I'll set up a coffee for tomorrow. Is that cool? You know, and they're basically just starting to, to create these networks for you. It's great. Now, I don't know if that was just my experience, but it was certainly so different to what I had known in New Zealand. And so I felt like coming back from that, there were a lot of things that I'd picked up uh, in terms of, I guess, being more open and, um, you, you know, being more of a connector, being more of a networker and, and really just um, not, not for myself necessarily, but just connecting other people. Yeah. And, and that's really been beneficial. You know, a great example of that, actually, I got to do a shout out to uh, my buddy, Sol Orwell. Uh, he's the founder of examine.com and he's the king of that. Like if he knows someone who's doing something cool and he knows another person who's doing something cool, He'll just, with no benefit to him in the short term, he'll just basically connect. And he'll reach out to people doing things cool and just say, hey, you're doing something really cool. And because of that, he's, he's become one of the people that's known for authentic networking. He's, you know, it's probably no um, coincidence that he lives in Canada. He lives in Toronto. Um, so, yeah, it was really interesting to, to have those different experiences which really showed, you know, how we can learn um, from everybody and, and be grateful for what we have, but also not be complacent um, and keep pushing forward to try and make the, the, the world a better place. So I know that sounds pretty kumbaya, but that's probably what I got from traveling a lot. Yeah, no, this is true. And it's good because I think, you know, someone who's had the luxury of traveling and I can resonate with a lot of those ideas that you, you said there, because I've been fortunate to be able to do that. You know, I'm privileged to, you know, spent 10 years of my life in New Zealand and, you know, have the honor of having a, a New Zealand passport, which I'm very grateful for. And it means more now than it did back then because now obviously I'm a little bit older. I like to think I'm a little bit wiser. I've made a lot more mistakes. I see things from a different perspective. And, you know, I know my, why my mom and dad moved there now to create a better life. And, you know, but being, but, but that doesn't mean much until you go and contrast it, right? It's like you don't know how good you've got to that's gone. And I always find it's quite ironic here, you know, in Australia where, oh, wow, it is so good. Like, so, and it's funny people who travel know and they're like like we've got it so good people complain and i'm like are you serious man like you live in a beautiful country it's it's safe it is safe compared to a lot of countries you know you can get 22 dollars an hour for washing dishes like you, you, the government's well well put together for the most part it's not correct you know and then you go to places people go oh yeah but italy and i said yeah, yeah you know go to europe whatnot it's beautiful lots of culture there's a pro and con but then i'm like you go try and get a job you go try and do the same thing like holidaying and living is different and i encourage people to go and do and i know it's not um cheap especially for my friends in new zealand you know where you are you know it's a long way and it can be expensive but i'm like you can't put a price on that experience 
and the education yeah. that it will give you. Because I always say, like, you will appreciate your own country more, but you will also get a perspective for, oh, wow, there is so much more. And I think it comes down to, again, you kind of take these, like, blinkers off and you're better, yeah. uh, you become a better communicator, you become better at being able to connect with people, especially people who are in different parts of the world. And as you rightly said, you know, you do, you'll find that certain people, depending on where they are, they have different mentalities. And a lot of my friends, I have a lot of friends from, from Canada too. It's funny, right? I always say like the Canadians seem to come to Australia and the Australians go to Canada. And um, those people who get out and travel, and it's almost like the Kiwis see the Kiwis that, that travel, they're more like, like go-getters, you know, I found like they more connect. Like I've got almost more Kiwi friends now in Australia than I had in New Zealand. Yeah. Purely, purely based on the fact that we share a common ethos, which is we, 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 yeah. we're passionate, you know, we want to make the world a better place. Again, as from my eyes, it sounds, uh, and you know, we, 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 we're open, we're curious souls. Um, so I think, yeah, that, I think that will resonate with a lot of people. And I think, you know, you, you pretty much bang on there with, <laughs> you know, that differentiation of, and how it can change your lens, if you like, and your perspective. And uh, on that point, I think it's really interesting that, you know, you look at some of the people that you've had on your podcast, you look at the, you know, the people that I've had on mine or the, the people that have had me on theirs, you see this crossover so often. And, and it, it often is those people who have a, I guess, a more down-to-earth, pragmatic ethos, you know, you know, I think the king of that is, is Eric Helms. You know, it's well known my admiration for Eric. He's one of my good buddies, and I, I just think he's one of the best in the biz. Similarly, I think, you know, Danny Lennon does great work. I think Sol um, behind the scenes does such fantastic work through examine.com. And there's these people who have a, a real pragmatic viewpoint of not just health, but of life. But they also have a very strong and clear ethos. You know, they're, they're not prepared to... Um, to acquiesce to someone who is not also living w within, you know, good ethical bounds and probably don't want to get into that too much right now, but we, we all know of the, um, the fairly clear cases of people within our industry who have done some pretty abhorrent things and you, you see the industry fairly evenly split off in between those who just say, oh, well, but he's a great practitioner or he's a great researcher and others who say, you know what? That may be the case, but I'm not going to support that individual anymore because of the way that they conduct their life. Yeah, no, I, I think for some, without naming names, some of the listeners who are pretty absolutely savvy in their circles, probably a few names are coming to mind, but um, it's very true. It's very true. And it's good that we have, you know, role models like yourself, like Eric, like Danny, like Sol, you know, um, this, I mean, I, mean, I talked to Eric about this and Eric, it's funny, right? This is a testament to Eric because he comes up vicarious on a lot of podcasts. Everyone's like, Eric, and it's like, yeah, because he's such a positive guy. Um, and without me reiterating it, but like he was like one of the protagonists for me that actually kind of <laughs> unveiled, I guess, my baptism into this, what we call, you know, team good guys. And it's not about good or bad, but again, you, you, know, you find Eric, you find people like you, you know, you find people like Danny, et cetera. And there's, there's a bit of a carry over there. And you find there's this kind of like, you know, community, if you will. And we're all, even though we're doing our own things, we're all kind of, we've got the same ethics. We've got the same values for the most part. We, we, you know, we come from a good place. And I think, you know, having that sort of more, uh, that, that humility as well, by, but, but as, as your prestige rises and perhaps, you know, your exposure and your popularity, still staying true to those values um, is really important. And I guess it's nice to see people who are at the, the top of the field doing that, if you like, and, and knowing that, okay, this is more authentic. And I feel there's a bit of a shift. And I think people are actually starting to smarten up now. And they're actually starting to yeah. see the gaps. Um, and yeah. now, you know, the people who perhaps aren't as popular on social media but need to be are becoming more popular, but more from a standpoint of that they are staying true and they're presenting good work over time. And there's no, there's no constant digression um, or any moral sort of crossovers. So I think, no, you, you bang on hundred yeah. percent. Um, I guess now to digress to um, the more lighthearted questions before my final question, uh, Cliff, and these are what I, what I like to uh, ask all my guests. <laughs> these are a bit more fun and lighthearted. So whatever comes to mind, um, and my first question is, if you could do <clears throat> superpower, what would it be and why? Oh, damn. Good one, eh? That's such a, that's such a tough question, actually. Probably the hardest one I ask my guests. 
<laughs> that is really tough. You can, it can be, you can make it up. You know what? I, I, I've got, I've strung a complete blank except for the fact that, um, when I was growing up, I, I was, I really loved the X-Men, right? Not the, uh, I, I don't, wasn't so keen on the movies and things as they started to emerge. But when I was young, this is, you know, back in the 80s, early 80s, I really liked the X-Men. And my favorite character was, um, was Beast, right? Because he was so he was strong, you know, big, strong dude. And I wasn't. I was a little, um, I was relatively athletic. I was pretty good at sports. You know, I played sports at a high level. But I, I was certainly wouldn't consider me strong. I was a skinny little kid. And I got into um, strength training originally because I was just too small to make the rugby team. They basically said, look, you're going to make the top rugby team. Not only that, you're going to, you're going to captain it if you can put some, some size on. Because as it stands right now, you won't even make the team. You're too small. So I spent a year basically bulking up, getting stronger, getting bigger. And I guess that had always been something that I wanted to achieve was to be, you know, strong, physically strong, but also mentally strong. And that was the thing that came through with, with Beast for me as a kid was, he was a, a nerd, like unashamedly a nerd, wearing his glasses, sitting there reading all day, but he was also the beast. He was strong and all that kind of stuff. So I don't know whether it's an answer because it's not a superpower, but I, I would love to strive towards being pragmatic and you know authentic and honest and, and also have that real, um, I guess, polymath outlook on life and what I do, you know, to, to do the things I love doing, learning languages and, you know, trying to play instruments, but also being strong and do my gardening and do research and all that kind of stuff. So I, I guess there's more of an archetype than a super a superpower. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think that's a great answer. Um, probably purely because selfishly I resonate that as well uh, with that as well. I think it's like a beautiful thing when you see that balance where, you know, because yeah. it's usually one or the other, right? It's like, oh, you're the nerd, you're the really intelligent guy, but you lack the communication skills or you're not the popular guy. But it's like, no, you, you can have you can have it all to a degree. You can almost be like Superman. You know, you can have, you can be very intelligent. You can be respectful with people. You can still kick ass in the gym, but you can still do your research. And yeah, you know, it's like I, live, I listen to heavy metal music. You know, I, I like to do my fashion, my modeling, but then again, you know, I'll deadlift three and a half, four times my body weight. Like it's, but I, but I like to lead by example and say, look, like it's not about me doing this, but like you said, it's about knowing that, oh, you can have that balance and be able to kind yeah. of switch, like you said, to an archetype. So no, I, I think that's actually a great answer, Cliff, and I really like that one. Um, Thanks, man. As a, as a, um, a, a nutritional you know, researcher and clinician, what is your favorite food or foods? And to kind of context that, if you could have one last meal, what would it look like? You can have entree, you can have drink, dessert. It might just be one thing. What would it? What would that be? It would be a close call. I'd probably say this is going to sound weird, I guess, for people, but I'd probably go sausages and kumara mash as my favorite meal. I could eat that all day, every day. Day just mashed kumara with some good sausages. Um, I'd probably wash that down with a beer. Yeah, nice. maybe. Um, and, and you know, afterwards though, if I'm going to have some dessert, it's either cookies and milk or um, some old fashioned donuts with milk. Hey, mate, classics, <laughs> classics. It's funny actually. I came over, you know, after spending ten years in New Zealand, I went to the supermarket, and I'm like, "Excuse me, mate, maybe you got the kumara?" Yeah, you know, my English accent. And he's like, "Kumara." I'm like. Yeah, you know, Kumara. And, it, and he's like, we don't sell it. I'm like, we you know. And anyway, it literally, I had to show him. And he's like, you mean sweet potato? I'm like, mate, I've been living yeah, in New Zealand for 10 years, bro. It's Kumara. Yeah. You know? <laughs> um, butchering. I get that a lot when I'm writing, writing plans. I write, you know, maybe putting Kumara as an example of a, you know, um, tuba carb sauce. And um, yeah. always get these questions back from American clients and whatnot. What the, what the fuck is that? <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's such a great food though. I love it. And, um, uh, my, my final question is, I guess, um, this is, oh yeah, cause I have a few, but I'll spin this one based on our conversation. Uh, if we could live forever, would you choose to live forever? Was that an option that you would say yes to? Again, that's a, that's a really good question. It's a really difficult one. I, I would, I would lean towards yes. And, and the reason is that this almost plays into the discussion of, of aging and age-related degeneration. 
a lot of times when I tell people that I'm interested in that and that we're, we're looking to pursue some research in that field and we're putting together these, these research ideas, most people actually say, oh, I wouldn't want to live forever or I, even I wouldn't want to live longer, right? Because they're immediately falling into that um, sort of archetype that you mentioned before where they're thinking about, oh, I wouldn't want to do that because I saw my auntie or uncle or granddad or whatever living the last 20 odd years of their life and it was terrible. But the, the, the key is not that, of course. The key is health longevity, not longevity, whereby I don't think we're necessarily going to push the boat out too much past 120 years. That seems to be a bit of a proxy for a maximal lifespan right now. But I think we can certainly, more of us can get a lot closer to that, and we can extend our health span within that lifespan. So I think if we can live well, then why wouldn't we want to continue to grow and evolve? So I would fall to the default position of probably, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, hundred percent. And I think, it, I mean, I know it's a really thought provoking question. I know these are rapid fire and I meant to be quick, but they are, they, they really get you thinking. And I think yeah. a lot of us, I mean, that is one of the great, one of those big questions, isn't it? It's like, you know, what's the meaning of life? Do you want to live forever? You know? And I think, it, it is, you hit the nail on the head again, it's that qualitative approach, you know, rather than just the mm. longevity itself. And I think where that ideology, even for me, you know, is, is the vampiric. It's that, you know, wow, imagine being young forever and knowledgeable and whatnot. But I think, I, I guess it comes down to the person. And I think a lot of the people who are more entrepreneurial, generally people having the podcast, they generally, generally do opt for yes, not everybody. Um, not to speak for people, but it's because there's so much more that you would generally want to do within your respective field but it's also the anticipation and excitement of knowing where's that gonna go like you know it's, yeah. it's almost like yeah you know you watch a good movie a good series you're like oh what's next like it draws you in you know and i guess to know that you're not going to be part of the next movie or the next series is you know a little <laughs> bit up, a little bit upsetting if i could put it in that context um yeah uh, on, on to my final question, which is a little bit more serious in nature, um, although those can have those digressions. Can you identify, Cliff, a, a, a fear that you've had in your life? It might be small, it might be big, whatever you're comfortable sharing. It might have been something that, you know, it might have been public speaking or something like that, that you had. Um, how you overcame that fear and fundamentally what you learned from it? Yeah, I, I think... Even now, the, the, the biggest fear, I think, is, is not being enough. You know, not being enough for the client, not being able to meet their needs enough, not being able to do a good enough talk um, or write a good enough book, you know. And I think when I was younger, I, I was hamstrung a lot by that. I would always feel a lot of... Um, it wasn't so much jealousy, more sort of despondence where I'd read, um, for example, I read, when I first read Blink, I think it was, I just thought, damn, Gladwell, such a good writer. I, I should just give up this writing thing because I'm shit, you know, in comparison. And the reality is I was shit, you know, if I look back at it compared to, say, someone like Malcolm Gladwell, there's no doubt about that. I got better. Um, but I think the... That, that the positive is that's also driven me to, to do a lot of self auditing. So if I write something, I'll always be thinking about how I could have done it better. If I do a talk, I'll always audit myself afterwards and think about what went well and what didn't. And I think I, I certainly haven't transcended it. That's for sure. Um, I, I don't have the same impact anymore. You know, when I first started speaking about 20 odd years ago, I, I would be debilitated by fear and anxiety for about three days before an event to the point where I often wouldn't eat for days on end because I was so anxious about it. Uh, but I just got ahead and did it anyway and just learned more or less on my feet. And then through that self auditing process became better at it. And I think now I'm, I'm even though I'm reluctant to say it, I'm comfortable enough to say that I am a, a very good speaker. Um, I, I, you know, the proof of the pudding is obviously in the cake, in the cake there because I um, am flying around the world to give talks to people and they keep getting me back. So there's something I'm doing right. But I think that's really the key fear is just not being enough. And I think the biggest learning is to understand that all I can do in the moment is what is my practicable best. 
um, you know, and be realistic about that because sometimes you get to a point where in any given moment you're trying to improve something and you're not improving it anymore, you're just changing it. And so basically, you know, using the Seth Godin mentality of you've got a deadline and then you ship it, but then also having that self-auditing where you are trying to improve over time. And, you know, I'm, I'm very cognizant of that because I, I try not to make any claims of being the guru or the expert in, in anything because I know that there's so much more to learn. Um, and I'll also defer to others, you know, within my sphere who I think are better at particular things than I am. So, um, like I say, yeah, it's still, that fear's still there, but hopefully I'm getting a better handle on it, particularly now that I'm uh, in my forties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That life experience definitely, uh, accounts for a lot. And I, I think that's, you know, a very appropriate way to sort of round out what's been a, you know, a very thought provoking and, and wide ranging conversation. I know I've certainly enjoyed it and I'll, I'll share this with you before I go cliff and it, it was what's fascinating you know, the more people I speak to and come in contact with, and, you know, I have the pleasure of, you know, being able to chat to people like yourself. And it's this common theme at the end where this fear is actually, it, if we kind of summarized it, it, it's the same fear all, all practitioners have or people who are very passionate have. And I think therein lies, uh, from what I've read uh, from um, uh, in, in a Tim Ferriss book, and, you know, he's sort of, anyone who knows Tim Ferriss, he sort of coagulates and teases out the habits and behaviors of, you know, the top performers, but it's got to be replicable. You know, take it with a grain of salt, take what works, throw away what doesn't. But something that was articulated really well was that the reason and the, 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 the behavior, the tell of world-class performers, athletes, or people who are at the top of their game, from whatever sense it is, is the fact that they consistently feel that they're not enough although it's not necessarily a hindrance or a problem because it obviously if you if you fall into depression then it's obviously not good those relationships need to be addressed but i think by having that this is now from what i've observed what makes us continually push forward or what makes us be better or are able to excel in your given field and looking at even those examples where you started and what you're doing now, it's like, wow, you look back and it's like, wow, you know, I, I wasn't good at this particular skill, but I am now. And now I get flown around the world to do it. It's like that proof's in the pudding, right? It's proof's in the cake. Um, but that is what keeps you going. That is what will essentially keep that productivity and that progression over time, which I think if anyone listening takes, you know, something out of, of, um, of what you just said there, like take that because, you know, if you want to achieve something, um, yeah, we all feel this, like we're all human. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a common um, emotion. So acknowledge it and use it to your advantage. Yeah, agreed. Um, Cliff, for people who want to find uh, out more about yourself, what you do, um, you know, I, again, I know we didn't get a chance to talk about it, but I know you, you have written a number of books, um, which perhaps we can, we can do a round two and talk a little bit more about those and a few other topics, but where's the best place to get in touch with you with those resources and, and keep up to date with, you know, a lot of the research that we've spoken about on this podcast. Yeah. So best uh, place to go to is just my website at cliffharvey.com. And there people can find the links out to the various things I do, whether it be uh, my books or my educational institute um, and links to my social. So yeah, go to the website and then follow me on social and you'll keep up to date with what I'm up to. Fantastic. Fantastic. And guys, for everyone listening, I will, as always, put those links in the show notes, uh, whether you're listening on iTunes, Spotify, or you're watching us uh, on YouTube. Uh, Cliff, thank you very much for your time once again. It's been very insightful. I know I've genuinely thoroughly enjoyed this conversation and uh, yeah, I look forward to perhaps divulging some more information and knowledge over time. Thanks, Bad. Likewise, it was awesome. Brilliant. All right, guys. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. As always, guys, if you really like this episode, make sure to leave a rating and a review. I know it's a small little thing, but it makes a huge difference and it helps us share this with more people and uh, reach across and help them too. So guys, as always, until next time, stay fearless.